Hi. How's it going? Good. OK, uh, like was mentioned, my name is Patrick, and I'm here today to talk about making modern websites. Uh, that's me. If you look me up on the internet, uh, that's also me. I take a lot of photos holding cakes. Uh, it's because my girlfriend makes me cakes every birthday. And uh, she's usually here, but she's at home watching our son. This has literally nothing to do with my talk. I'm just really stoked that I have a son. I'm a new dad. So uh, thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I, uh, like was mentioned, I work at Microsoft, specifically the Edge browser. Uh, it is wonderful, but uh, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it later. I'm hanging out in the Edge sponsored area in the other room. Feel free to come by. But today, I am here to talk to you about websites, uh, specifically making websites and the fact that it is pretty hard. I don't know about you guys, but when I started making websites, they looked a lot like this. Um, and there wasn't really much to it. There was just text content, links, maybe a couple of HTML tags if you knew what you were doing. And it was great. Uh, there wasn't a way to do this sort of thing really before unless you were into Gopher. And uh, you know, people were just kind of excited that they could even look up stuff on the internet. And eventually, though, users got kind of used to this and they wanted more and more. Browsers started adding features during the browser wars. So we added stuff like favicons or SVG, uh, started adding more features and more features. And then all of a sudden, we get into this place that we feel like we have been in the past few years, where we just have tons and tons and tons of new APIs that are constantly being added to the web platform. And it can start to feel kind of overwhelming. But the great thing about web developers is that we make tools. Uh, we make a lot of tools. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of tools that are generally really well done. And uh, in addition to working on Edge, I work for one of them. Uh, I'm the maintainer for Modernizer. I'm assuming most web developers are familiar with Modernizer. Is there anybody who's not? I can give a quick. You're not familiar with Modernizer? OK, cool. Uh, it just as a, a quick reminder, it's the second most used library on the web. It's used by over two thirds of Fortune 500 websites in 2016. It's used by over one fifth of Billboard's top uh, 100 hot singles on his sweatshirt. That's Justin Bieber actually wearing Modernizer on a hoodie. It's a real hoodie. Uh, designed by Paul Irish and Kathleen Marish. Uh, well, at least they wrote the code. <laughs> but I, I just thought it was weird that Justin Bieber had a code hoodie. Um, now, anyway, uh, since most of you seem to be familiar with Modernizer, you might not be aware of the fact that a few months ago we actually shipped Modernizer version 3. And there was a ton of new features in Modernizer version 3. Uh, we went completely modular. We had 100% test coverage, where before we didn't. Uh, a lot of stuff. And you might remember the website looked a lot like this. It was really pretty for its time, but it's starting to look really dated. It kind of looks like one of those slides that you pull up now in the Wayback Machine. And it's like, hello, uh, can you believe Twitter used to look like this? Uh, and so after a few months of work, we ended up with something that was a more modern design. Uh, that looks like this. It's the new homepage for modernizer.com if you go there today. But this is what I'm really here to talk about, uh, the download section of modernizer.com. It's a fairly straightforward web application, but we were able to build in a ton of cutting edge features uh, with really great back support. And I want to show you how we did that. So the first one that I'm here to talk about is Fontface. And you might be saying Fontface isn't a new technology. I know. I work at Microsoft. We made it up. Uh, IE4 is when Fontface came through. It's been around for a really long time. Uh, but one thing you might notice in Fontface, if, especially if you're traveling internationally without a good data connection is that your nice web fonts end up looking like this most of the time. They just kind of go away and while they're loading. And it sucks because it, the site completely works. It just looks broken. You can you know, go and copy all that text that is invisible and paste it, and it's still there. Everything's functioning. You just can't, you're just waiting on that font to load. And so um, does anybody here read specifications, like HTML specifications? Hey, we got one couple. Well, you really should. They're awesome, because you can find really cool stuff like this. It's the CSS font loading specification. And what this gives you is the ability in JavaScript to know when fonts have been loaded. So you have a really, really straightforward API that looks something like this. You have a document.fonts, which is the new API that's been added. Uh, that has a ready method. That ready method is a promise, so it's identable. And then you, uh, just inside of that, we're able to add a function. And so what we did on the modernizer site was this. On, we grab our document.body. And then we're able to add the class list. Uh, we're able to add a class to the class list that says our font is loaded. And so rather than our font definition looking like this, where we have our web font at, at the top and then our fallback fonts for 
the few browsers that don't support it or in the bad network cases, we end up rewriting it to look like this. So we have uh, our basic Helvetica and Sans Serif fonts to begin with, and then once our font has been loaded and we are able to add that dynamic uh, class with JavaScript, we're able to overwrite that font family with a new one and get our web font definition immediately. And so um, instead of this, we get something like that. Just a real quick little snap uh, like that. And uh, the only issue with this is that the CSS font loading isn't the best support right now. There's in Firefox, it's in Chrome. Uh, since it's in Chrome, it's in Opera and some mobile browsers, but we're not in Safari, we're not in Edge yet. Uh, and so you might have to use a polyfill. Uh, we ended up using Fontface Observer. It's a great polyfill from a Danish designer, uh, Bram Stein, and it's a very simple API, similar API. Uh, this was what we had originally. It changes to something like this. Uh, we are able to explicitly list the font that we're listening for and then call dot load to start observing whether or not that font has been loaded. And uh, then we just do the exact same code. Uh, but do a little bit of breaking news. It's great to have all this stuff in JavaScript, but since most of the time we're doing something similar to what Modernizer would do, which is to say we just want to load that font in automatically, it'd be great to not have to rely on JavaScript. And that's exactly what the Chrome dev team has uh, started specking out with this new font display property. Uh, font display is something that you would actually add to your at font face descriptor. And it's just a new property with a couple of different uh, values, such as block and swap. Swap is um, Block is the old technique, which is where you just completely block everything. It sucks. Please don't ever use it. Uh, swap is what Modernizer's site is doing, where it just immediately swaps it through. You can also define fallback, where after, say, 200 milliseconds, if the font still hasn't loaded, you can just say, stick with this one font. Don't load the next one until a full page refresh. That way, you don't have that dance. Uh, it is in Chrome 50, uh, which is the latest stable, but it's the only one that supports it. Hopefully, it's going to be added to other browsers in the future, but it is still a um, kind of a straw man spec. So, like I said, we have this experience of dancing back and forth, which is a little bit of a crappy experience. Uh, if you're a UI developer, you might not like the fact that it's jumping. So, one way around that is you're able to set something like, say, local storage or cookie where uh, it's saying that the font has been loaded, and then on page load, you're able to check if that's, thing, if that's there and set your class appropriately. So you avoid that jump until there's a full page change. And it's great, because you have that cookie set, and you know for a fact that it's there. Uh, if it's been cached properly, the font itself, and if the user didn't clear that cache, and if the browser didn't remove part of that cache. And the point that I'm trying to make is that at best, it's always kind of an educated guess. Uh, we can add the fact that the font has been loaded, but we don't know for 100% fact, uh, unless we use some even newer APIs, like Service Worker. Now, I'm assuming most people have hit the hype train on Service Worker. Are there people that are unaware of Service Worker? Totally cool if you're not. No? Cool. Uh, service workers, uh, I'll go over, they're kind of a big deal. Uh, they give us offline experiences, push notifications, background syncs, tons and tons and tons of new APIs. They're amazing in the future of the web. It's great. Uh, but we're only using a tiny subset on our site because it's all we really needed. Um, we're using fetch and cache. Uh, fetch is a network proxy, basically any network request that goes out. Uh, whether it be through your CSS, your HTML, or your JavaScript, will go through this uh, before it hits the network. So you're able to reply with either uh, stuff that is stored in your cache, or uh, you can generate new responses. It's really, really powerful. Uh, we also have the cache API, which is your programmable cache. You're able to um, hold on to something rather than uh, guessing whether or not the browser actually has it cached. You can clear it yourself. You can add it yourself. It's wonderful. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so. Like I said, Modernizer has become 100% modular uh, in version 3 as opposed to version 2, which was one, just one big monolithic file. And all those individual files are uh, require JS modules. That's because the Modernizer 3 project started four years ago at this point. Hopefully, we're moving over to ES6 modules in the near future, but we have, I just had a baby, so cut me some slack. Um, so uh, the problem with it being required JS modules is that every single one of those checkboxes means it's a, different, uh, it's a different file that has to be downloaded in order to build something. Uh, it's over 262 modules in addition to multiple different options on the side. It brings up to almost over 280 files that can be added. Uh, and since each individual file might rely on other files, clicking one of those checkboxes might be dozens of requests, which suck, because we want to have a really fast, pleasurable experience for our users. No one comes to modernizer.com to hang out. They're there to get out of there as quick as possible with the JavaScript they need to do their work. And so we use Service Worker. 
uh, the service worker that we use will allow us to cache everything, and so whenever we tap something, it will only have to load once, then it's stored locally, and every other time it's been requested, it will be um, responded to with very quickly uh, from the local machine rather than having to hit the network. Uh, so if you've never used Service Worker before, you're unfamiliar with it, this is how you register a Service Worker, navigator.serviceworker.register. Um, the only thing that's important here is the path to your Service Worker. You have to register it from the context that you want to control. So for a, this example, Example, the file that we're loading is modernizer.com slash serviceworker.js. That gives us control of modernizer.com. If you were to load it from modernizer.com slash js slash serviceworker.js, you would only have control of any URL beginning in modernizer.com slash js. So you have to be very mindful of where you store it. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Uh, so this is an example of our cache file that we're using. Uh, we're doing a little bit of prefetching. Uh, to allow us to grab that font that we talked about earlier, and in addition to that, set up the cache so that any request that's requested later on will be added to it automatically. Uh, so we establish our prefetch cache up at the top. Uh, each cache can have a name, so you could uh, separate your cached assets. And then we listen for the install event from uh, inside of the service worker file. Uh, that will be fired once the service worker has been activated and is ready in the browser. Uh, we prefetch the one totally rad sans file, and then we wait until our cache is open, and then we start uh, requesting all of those assets that ha we have in our precached file, in this case, just the totally rad sans. Now, uh, since we have our stuff precached, we are able to add an event listener for the fetch event. So any file that's requested after this is able to be, we check to see if it is, uh, on the fetch event, we, check, we will respond uh, with uh, the, cache, the matched cache file, if it exists, uh, and so we return it, and if it doesn't, we go out and we fetch it from the network, and then we cache it locally. So there's this sort of middle step before you actually hit the network, but that means it can be replied to directly from the device once it exists locally. Service workers are amazing, but their support is not amazing. Um, there's only... Uh, really, Firefox has it in its nearly stable. Uh, Chrome, it's been around for quite some time. They're the OGs on it, therefore it's an Opera as well. It's coming to Edge, hooray. Uh, it's not coming to IE because IE is dead, hooray. And uh, it's hopefully going to be in Safari. We know, you know it's Apple, so no one knows for a fact. And so that just kind of sucks. Um, and I was really bummed out when I really thought about how few people, while a lot of people use Chrome, there is a lot of people that don't use Chrome. And so we wanted a way to get around, still have that kind of offline experience. And so we went with the douchebag, AppCache itself. AppCache is a douchebag. If you've never used AppCache, good, because it's terrible. It was a result of Google Gears back in the like, MySpace days. It was kind of an interesting idea, but service workers are like way, way, way better. Um, but just so happens that AppCache does cover the use cases. And in addition to that, it has amazing support. It's green, like all over the Opera Mini, which it would be cool if Opera Mini had it, but Opera Mini doesn't do a lot of things. But I mean, IE has AppCache, and that's dead, so it's phenomenal. So we want to do something like this, where we have Service Worker and Navigator. And if we, that means it exists, it's a, uh, we will register our Service Worker. And if it doesn't, we want to add AppCache. Uh, and so in order to add AppCache, you have to add it to the HTML element. Up there, we have that manifest attribute. The problem with all of this is that the manifest attribute cannot be added dynamically. That HTML tag has to be there at initial parse time. Um, so it can't, like, you can't just say, like, and add a manifest attribute easily. Um, what we were able to figure out is that we were able to actually load up an iframe in an invisible, or sorry, a hidden iframe at the bottom of the page with a special page that just loads that app cache file. Uh, that app cache file looks like this. Once we have added the uh, app cache file to the page, uh, the app cache file takes over the entire domain. And since uh, from within that iframe, it's able to take over the entire domain, and every asset after that is registered. So we're able to have app cache goodness on the browsers that only support app cache and service workers on the much better browsers. Uh, so just a quick refresher, uh, the reason why app cache is nowhere near as powerful as service workers, this is a cache manifest. It's the entirety of you, what you're able to do. It's mostly declarative. Uh, you have to say cache manifest up at the top because it's screaming its name at you. And then you're able to list all the assets that you want dynamically. The modernizer team will uh, programmatically add all the different detects in there 
on uh, build time. So we're like generating this file. So, uh, and then you also have your network where you can only um, reply with uh, Git or Post or other things. And you almost always want an asterisk. App cache is an interesting idea for a hack, but don't ever rely on it. It's way, way better. Uh, service workers are way better. A uh, cool thing is that I tried this from my uh, laptop on my hotel Wi-Fi when it was under high load when I got here. And the Modernizer website took 20 seconds to load. Uh, in Edge, and after I loaded it a second time, once we had that primed app cache, it took it down to 190 milliseconds. It was really, really, really fast. This is a big deal, and if you have mostly static sites, say your blog or your company's website, or even just a company uh, website that has a lot of dynamic assets, but you have cached files, it's phenomenally fast. Go for it and check it out. Um, so yeah, but the main thing to remember is that service workers are way better than app cache. Don't it, app cache is literally being removed from the spec like this week probably. It's going away, but it's good to know as a fallback. Um, service workers are the future, and you may have noticed a word in there that might seem familiar. Uh, specifically, workers. It's because it's a special kind of worker called a web worker. Now, web workers have actually been around for a really long time. They were added to WebKit back in 2008. Um, 2008 is a really long time ago. That's version two for Chrome when it looked like this. It, it's a really, really long time ago on the web. And they're great. Uh, I don't understand why people don't use web workers more. Service workers are cool, but web workers have been around for way longer and they can do some phenomenal things. And so um, if you're not familiar with them, you might be wondering, what can they do? Um, well, as we all are aware, browsers in general are single threaded by default. Uh, what that means is because, say, you have a script above the content of your page, the browser doesn't know for a fact that you're not going to modify the DOM below the page or above it, and so it has to parse and execute all your JavaScript before it can continue rendering that page, which sucks um, because most of the time we're smart enough to not do that. Uh, that also means that all of our different assets are end up fighting for the same CPU time. So if you try and do a lot of crunching on numbers, you get a really hardcore janky file. Anybody that's ever added a scroll attribute to a page will probably notice that the site's performance goes really, really crappy really, really quickly. Um, so web workers give us the ability to offload all of our tasks into a background thread. And so we're basically not given access to the DOM, but we're given access to another thread to execute all of our code in. Uh, so we can get that same buttery smooth performance on the front end and be able to get really um, intensive operations uh, s still. Uh, and so super, exp uh, super expensive functions become super cheap. Uh, and so we were thinking about how we could abuse this feature on the modernizer team, and we came up with dynamic file size calculations. So uh, as I've mentioned a number of times, the modernizer 3 is 100% modular. Uh, that's because uh, for a long time, when we're looking at the JavaScript file that's used on a good two-thirds of the web, we'll find that there are dozens and dozens of dtex that people are using that they in no way need or even reference anywhere else in their page. You probably don't need to know if rounded borders are supported in browsers because they're supported in all browsers at this point. A lot of features that people were just saying, I just want the whole file easily so I can build a website. And that sucked because as the modernizer team, we were culpable in making the web a crappier place. We were making it slower for all the users, and it sucked. So we wanted to show uh, developers exactly how much weight they were adding to their page every single time they checked off one of those attacks. And so we have this little section up here, and you'll see it's a 0% checked. By default, we're 752 bytes. And every single time we checked off something, we wanted to show people exactly how many bytes were added, but we didn't want to have to talk to a server. Uh, and so we came up with a web worker. Uh, web workers are really easy to register. You just have to check, do that uh, check at the top again, wor uh, worker in window. And if it exists, we are able to register our gzip worker. Um, our, you just have to set up a, a listener. I'm using the window just for ease of code slides. Please don't ever add stuff to the window. Uh, but all we're doing here is uh, grabbing the config, which is just a big object, and passing in a function. We have our gzip worker, which is the reference to our worker. We post in the config as a big JSON object. It gets stringified and sent to it. And then on message, which is the built-in function that is basically the reply from the worker, it's the way that we're able to communicate, it will uh, execute our callback that we pass into it. So this is the inside of the actual function, or the actual worker's function. Uh, we have this special uh, import scripts up at the top. Uh, we're importing a couple of uh, NPM packages. There's Paco Deflate and Pretty Bytes. Paco Deflate is a uh, gzip implementation completely in JavaScript that works in the browser. Uh, Pretty Bytes is a uh, way to give, um, take like a long, num a big number that represents the bytes and get like kilobytes or megabytes out of it. 
so we have our on message listener. We parse that uh, object that is passed in because it becomes a string. It's, it implicitly does like a json.stringify on that object. Uh, we grab the build query and then we will uh, pass in the build.length, which is the string version of modernizer's build, uh, into pretty bytes, and that gives us the size. And then we do the same thing with paco.deflate to get the gzipped size. Level 6 is the default gzipping level. And we get the compress size, and then we pass that big object back, and then we're able to update the UI, which is awesome. Um, but you might have noticed that I mentioned uh, we have to get the build string, and that's because we have this build, build button up here, but it's a complete lie. We need to have the build size in order to know uh, how, how many uh, megabytes or kilobytes, hopefully not megabytes, uh, the builds are, and so we need to do builds constantly in the background every single time you check something off. Uh, and so we have another worker that is our build worker that's constantly doing these updates in the background that looks uh, like this. We have the same registration. We do a new worker for build. And then uh, our, uh, it just, all we, all we are doing is uh, passing in that same config to get the, build, the built file. We're calling in r.js, which is a browser supported version of require.js, because remember we're using require modules, unfortunately. And then we also call in modernizer's build.js file, which is an isomorphic builder. It's what we use on the command line, in the browser, anywhere that JavaScript executes, basically. So we are calling in the require.js require for the build uh, file. And then we uh, get the builder. And then we establish our on message handler. So now that we're within require.js land, we're able to grab that config, create the dynamic modernizer file, and generate the output in a string. Uh, yep. And so what's great about this is that since we're doing it by the t every time you check off a uh, button, uh, by the time you get to the big build button, your bu it's already built. And so it's a much, much faster experience. You might be wondering, since I'm talking about progressive enhancement, what if their browsers don't support workers? Like I said, it's 2008. It's a crazy long time. Everyone supports these. But on the off chance that you're using a browser that doesn't, it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, what we'll do instead is just build whenever someone clicks off that build button. And so it would be cool if they could get the dynamic allocator file size, but since they don't have a browser, it's not that big a deal. Uh, we'll just build it then. Uh, but inside of that build button is actually a pop-up menu that ends up looking like this. And we have a couple of different options inside of there. There's the actual build. There's the command line config, since you're able to use modernizer from the command line. There's also grunt options that work for gulp, a um, couple other things. And all of them have that copy to clipboard option, because for a lot of times, you might be doing a demo, and you might not really want to have to save a file. You just want to add it to your own file later on. And so we end up using something called Zero Clipboard. Excuse me, Zero Clipboard's a great uh, API that's been around for a long time. It's a great library, rather. It was on GitHub. I think they're still using it. And the API is really straightforward. Uh, all you have to do is we will grab the content, which is just becomes a big, long string, which is that build that we have. And then we say Zero Clipboard on copy. Uh, we, sorry. Uh, we grab the clipboard data, and then we set it to text plane, and we pass in that content. So it's a really straightforward API. It's really clean, and it's great. The problem is that it's Flash, which we all know sucks a lot. Uh, Flash is old. It's dying. It's going away. It's terrible. Um, and so we, on top of that, a lot of people don't turn on Flash. I, I hate Flash. I don't have it on my laptop. Do other people disable Flash? Because you probably should. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo to you. You should turn off Flash. It's dying and it's terrible. Uh, and so as a result, we can't rely on it. But Modernizer has a detect for Flash. And so we're doing modernizer.flash. We load in zero, uh, zero clipboard. And if it doesn't exist, we do something else. Uh, and that's something else. We couldn't really figure out a way, this was about a year and a half ago, uh, to have the full JavaScript implementation uh, for copying to clipboard because the APIs are really difficult to detect if they actually function in the browser. And so we end up loading a text box, uh, which is great. Rather than having to do any copy to clipboard fanciness, all we have to do is just pop open a, a text box that's populated with the contents, pre-selected, users are able to select it themselves. The code to do it is really straightforward. Um, you know, you just fill in the block yourself, and you select it. It's great. It's easy, and people are able to use it, and it still functions is the big thing to keep in mind. We have a better experience for people who happen to be running Flash, and we have a functioning experience for people who are smart and choose not to enable Flash. Um, but cool thing, like I said, we were about a year and a half ago with that trying to figure out a good API, and there is a new library that is wonderful that uses user agent sniffing, which sucks, but does some really good, uh, gives you a full uh, co copy to clipboard implementation in JavaScript with no flash. Uh, it's great. Clipboard.js is wonderful. We'll be adding it to Modernizer. Again, I just had a kid cut me some slack. Um, so 
there is that pop-up, and we talked about copy to clipboard, and obviously on the other side of that is the download option. Uh, remember, up until now, we have not talked to the server for anything other than downloading files, and so in order to download this dynamically generated file, we need to do it completely client-side. And so we use a couple of different APIs for that, specifically um, the blob uh, constructors, uh, the URL API, and the download attribute. So for uh, the code for it is really straightforward. It's just what you see here. Um, we have the build, which gets us the string of the modernizer content. Then we pass it into a new blob constructor. We pass in the content in an array. Uh, and you give it the type of text plane. That will generate a giant binary blob inside of the browser that represents the file uh, that we want to download, uh, rather than just the text string representation of it. Uh, we then create a, a, a href attribute for our anchor tag that we're going to generate. So this gives us a way to reference that blob by URL. So when someone clicks on it, you get all of the actions that you would normally associate with clicking on a link. That is, in this case, a file popping up. Then finally, we're able to give it the download attribute. Download attribute gives it a pretty name. Uh, so rather than get the big hash that's generated, because the uh, the URL object that's created just gives you like a 18 character long hash that's ugly and meaningless. You're able to give it a pretty name that people understand represents modernizer when they download it 14 times to their desktop and want to remember which one's which. Uh, and so the code, because it's a React app, ends up looking like this, uh, which is awesome. And you just get this pop up. It says modernizer or custom. It's beautiful, without, all without losing, leaving the browser. Support, though, is a little bit sketchy. Blob constructors are around for a while. They work great. Uh, same thing with blob URLs. The issue for us is that download attribute, and that kind of sucks. In addition to that, it felt kind of weird having a completely client-side uh, app when we have a server with all that content on it already. It's only about 61% browser support, so it felt kind of ich. And so I started looking at the way we constructed this page and thinking about the fact of, like, what do we really have here? Uh, but a bunch of checkboxes and a button. And so what do you do? What does this look like in like basic HTML? Anybody? It's just a big form. It's just checkboxes and a button. And so what do you do with forms? You just post it. We send it to the server. And so uh, rather than we having uh, just this code, we're able to have a little bit of a sniff in our generator. We're able to say, if it supports all those APIs, we have that link where we're able to do everything on the client side. And if it doesn't, we uh, send it to uh, we have a button type submit, and we're able to send it posted to the server. The server will generate it. It will reply with that browser. And so it's great. It just functions. It works for browsers at that point that don't even support any of those APIs, and you still get a thing. And all that's possible because we built it as a form. We used decent markup. And the great thing about decent markup is it is supported everywhere. Uh, it has been around for a very long time. And if you just use HTML for what it's used for, you really don't even need CSS. It actually functions completely fine without CSS. You can disable your CSS in Firefox easily, Safari easily to check this out. Modernizer com slash download, all of it makes sense. Your content flows in a way that uh, all of your metadata is directly below each one of those listed APIs, even though it's completely on the other side of the page. It works great. And what was cool about that was that since it, we uh, didn't even really need JavaScript, in fact, modernizer.com works in links. It works in a text-based browser that's older than me simply because we wrote it according to HTML standards and didn't have any problems whatsoever. You can check it out. It works. It's pretty cool. Not only will it function, you will actually be able to download that file and save it locally because we're posting it to the server. It works 100%. It's great. It's 100% client-side unless it can't, which I love building client-side apps, but I love building functioning apps even more. And so we are able to do stuff on the server side to make it function properly. On our server side, since we are using almost completely static files, we are able to say we are 100% static files. Uh, we are using Happy. I used to work at Walmart. We made this amazing thing called Happy.js. It's a phenomenal library. You should be using it instead of Express. Um, and all we are doing uh, are instant. This is like almost our entire server config. We are opening up a new server. We have our routes, which is an array. And then we're passing in our path, which is just a file matcher. So all we are doing is saying, if you get modernizer.com, slash serviceworker.js, it looks up that static file in the exact location that it would be. There's no dynamic compilation. Everything functions really, really fast. Uh, so I lied a little bit, though, because obviously we needed to post it. It's really only 99% static files because we need to do that build, building when you uh, have a config. And so what we, we had to add this quick function. All we're doing is uh, calling in the API 
we're grabbing, sorry, we're grabbing the config from the post since, it's a, since it is formatted like a query post and not like modernizer's config. We have to generate our config from it, and then we pass that into modernizer.build. And then uh, we just reply with it with a couple of uh, specific HTML headers, like your content type and the file name. And it's great. It works. You go from this to this in browsers that don't support it. And you're, our, all we had to do was update our server config to look like that. It works for all browsers. And it, I, I mean it works for all browsers. It works in Mosaic, too completely functional. I tested this like a day ago. It works. You get a file pop up in Mosaic. It was one of the proudest moments of my life because all we had to do was change our code from this to this. We had to change a button to an input because button element didn't exist when, we, when Mosaic shipped. We had to make a, what, 10 character change? It took two hours to find a computer that could actually run Mosaic, and it took 10 minutes to fix it for it. Uh, it it's wonderful. And it's, the point that I'm making is that all of this is awesome because HTML is really cool. We can make a lot of really, really amazing websites. And if you've built it according to standards, even if you're using cutting edge features, it all functions. Um, and not only that, we we're able to build all this stuff with tools. Uh, now, uh, I work on another, some other uh, tools, including uh, Bower, which still exists. Uh, and in, in addition to a lot of people use NPM and Bower to make their websites, and they want to do stuff like Bower install NPM. They want to do stuff like NPM install uh, modernizer. Sorry, on both of those. Um, and it, the problem is that there's not really a file to install. There's 262 modules now, so we can't really register one of those files. And their response was inevitably, I don't care. I want to send PM install modernizer. I want to do it anyway. It doesn't matter. Uh, there are 262 modules. If you do the math, which I think I am doing properly, it's like you would take down all of NPM. It's like more atoms than exist on Earth or something ridiculous. There's no reason to actually, there's no realistic way to actually register every, every single possible permutation of those modules on NPM or Bower. But people still want it. And so we had to sit and think, and we're like, well, our server's already building everything, so maybe we could use our server for something, but how would we match up what people want? And so a lot of you said you used Modernizer before. Do you remember the fact that up at the top, you have that link that represents your build of Modernizer? You're able to copy it, put it in your browser, and get all the little things that you want checked off automatically, right? It's cool. Uh, well, the cool, even cooler is that NPM and Bower allow you to use arbitrary URLs. And so you're able to do something like this, where you're npm install dash save on that exact same URL without changing anything. And you're able to get your custom version of Modernizer downloaded to your NPM or Bower. Um, and the code for that just ends up looking like this. We do user agent sniffing. The Modernizer team does do user agent sniffing sometimes. Uh, we check to see if we are Bower. If we are, we build for Bower. If it's NPM, we build for NPM. And if it's anything else, we just resp uh, reply with the download page HTML, the React app. Uh, in order to get the Bower API, it's pretty straightforward. We have our uh, archiver uh, module, which is a, a node module that generates uh, gzip or tar archives. Uh, then we build up the modernize, we do modernizer.build on it. We pass in the Bowser, sorry, bower.json uh, file and we give it the name and then we reply with a big tar file and it works. That was all we had to do. It was like 15 lines of code. NPM, it was almost the exact same thing except, uh, you know, bower.json is different from uh, package.json and so we had to tweak that a little bit. And um, you might have noticed actually that you were talking about how you couldn't register your modernizer on NPM, but we were using modernizer in our thing to load it. And that's because there is a modernizer module on NPM, but it is probably not what you would initially think. It is not directly modernizer. It's the, it has all the feature detects inside of it, but it is not um, the way you use on your website. It's what you would use to build the files. It's the CLI tool that we're using to generate all of these tools that I've shown you today. Uh, and so you're able to do something like this, where you have modernizer.build, and you're able to write out your custom modernizer file. It was great. I thought it was super flexible. I'm a huge Vim nerd, and so I thought it was great, but a lot of people aren't super Vim nerds, and so it's, the interface is kind of clunky. You have to make this big JSON file. You have to be even comfortable on the command line tool. And we were, it bummed me out, because I was thinking, 
you know, it would be great for more people to be interested in the command line tool. It's super valuable. It's super helpful. And I wanted to get more people into it. And I was thinking, you know, we already have an API that we like, that React app, uh, modernizer.com. And so I thought, maybe let's reuse it. And so we did. And so I rebuilt the modernizer.com app completely in React for the command line. Uh, and you can check it out if you want. Here, let me see if it's up. And it functions completely. It has keys. Uh, you can click off the features that you want. You can type in CSS in your search bar. You get the blop for it. Ooh. Uh, doo -doo. You can, it is responsive, and so as you readjust the page size, you get different column sizes, and you can build it and even open on CodePen, which will f I just realized will fail because I'm on airplane mode. Uh, but it works completely, and you can check it out if you want to. If you SSH into front trends at patrickketner.com with the password front trends, it should pop up directly with the Modernizer command line app. It's pretty cool. I heard there might be Wi Fi issues right now, but feel free to check it out. All that's possible, though, because React is really cool. I'm a big fan. If you haven't tried it, it's great. Um, so yeah, in summation, really what I want you to come away with from all of this is that you should make awesome stuff. Don't be afraid to use cutting edge features because that's the way that the browsers are able to determine whether or not those features make sense or if they're a big douchebag like app cache. Um, so just make cool stuff and have a lot of fun. Um, feel free to contact me. I am Patrick Kettner. I'm everywhere on the internet as Patrick Kettner. I'm even Patrick Kettner at Microsoft.com. If you have any questions about Edge or anything else, seriously, feel free to email me. If you want to chat or anything, feel free to contact me anywhere. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody.